Well, good morning all. Good morning and welcome to our worship this morning, the, the second Sunday of, of, of Lent. Um, welcome to all and to any visitors. We have any visitors with us this morning? Return visitors, yes, lovely to have you, lovely to have you here. More return visitors. And visiting from, oh yes, Florida. <laughs> so that, you don't really count as a visitor. Uh, any others, any other visiting this, this morning? Visiting from, lovely to have you with us, lovely to have you. And a reminder that following the service, uh, we serve tea and coffee outside the, outside the West Hall. And it seems the sky is turning blue, so it will be, it will be out, outside, hopefully, hopefully. Right, our notices, uh, number of notices this morning. Uh, first of all, um, looking back, we had a, a, a very nice, messy, very well-attended messy church yesterday, despite the rain, which came at just the wrong time. We had messy church yesterday afternoon from 5 to, to 6.30. Lovely to see some of the, so many children there. And thanks to the CCY team who put that together uh, each month. It's very much appreciated. Before that yesterday, um, there was a tea party uh, that some of us attended. And that was a tea party to celebrate... Hilda Young's 95th birthday, right? <laughs> so that was, a, that was a, a lovely occasion, celebrating Hilda's birthday, which was actually on the, on the Friday. Right, other notices. The Lenten services that are held by the Warwick Alliance of Churches each Tuesday during Lent. The first one was, was uh, last Tuesday in Warwick Holiness Church. This week, it's here in Christchurch, and we actually haven't hosted one of these services since before COVID. And so I hope people will come and, and support that as members from the other churches in the Warwick Alliance, which covers Paget and Warwick and Southampton, come to join us uh, for, for worship. Um, so that's on Tuesday. It's at 7.30. It's at 7.30, and we provide refreshments afterwards. So if you're able to help with that, that again would be, would be much appreciated. Next Sunday uh, morning, it's first Sunday of the month, so there'll be brunch following our, our morning worship at 10 o'clock. And then looking further ahead, you'll see in the notices there that work has started on the Easter Memoriam booklet. If you'd like to remember a, a loved one in that booklet, then please contact Sandra in the office. So these are all the notices for this morning. So let us worship God. As we sing from the Psalms, and the hymn we find at hymn number 59, O come and let us to the Lord in songs our voices raise. Hymn 59. <laughs>
Come to me and listen to my words. Hear me, and you will have life. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day to offer you our worship and our praise. We gather in this season of Lent, a time of reflection, a time in a sense of testing, testing the strength of our faith and our trust in your ways as they were shown to us in Christ. And we come with your whole church in heaven and on earth to reflect and to offer you praise, to acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all life, the wonders of creation, the distant galaxies beyond our sight and understanding, the beauty of this planet on which we live with its rich diversity of life and its beautiful oceans and mountains and deserts and plains its diversity of plant life and animal life and of human life. People of different races and cultures and with different histories and of different faiths, but all bearing your image. And so we acknowledge you as a God who creates and a God who in love sustains and who through the guidance and the prompting of your spirit leads us in the ways of life. Your spirit, which at times comes to guide, to prompt, to challenge, even perhaps to rebuke. And the spirit that comes at times to comfort and console and support in times of need. We confess that we do not always respond to the spirit's prompting. And we go our own way. At times we find your word and the words of your prophets and the words of Christ hard, and it is easier to turn aside. And so for the times that we have done that, and let ourselves down, and let you down, and let others down, we ask your forgiveness. Forgiveness the wrong we have done or the hurt that we have caused. Forgive the ways in which we have let others down in their need as they have looked to us for help and support. And as we ask for their forgiveness and their patience with us, we ask yours and pray for the assurance of that forgiveness that we might leave behind the faults and the failings of the past and the guilt that comes with them. Enable us to see this as a new day and a new beginning when we listen more attentively to what you ask of us to follow more faithfully the paths down which you call us. And as we grow closer to you, so too we will grow closer to one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The words of Scripture with which we opened our, our worship this morning come from, the, come from the prophet Isaiah. Come to me, the prophet said, come to me and listen to my words. Hear me and you will have life. In a sense, God was using him to invite them to trust in what he was telling them. And similarly too, when we look at our scripture passage for today from Mark's gospel, when Jesus took his disciples away from the shores of the Sea of Galilee and away to the north, and had words with them, very much at the essence of what he was saying was about, was about trust. We used to, uh, in youth groups, had various trust, trust games. One, one was where you would link, you would link arms, right, with the person opposite, and there might be 10 or 12 of you, six on either side, lined up like that, linking. And then a volunteer would run and leap onto these linked arms. It took a certain amount of trust. There's another, another one we used to do, um, and Ethan's going to help me with that. He volunteered. It was, so, it was good of him. Ethan, out you come for a moment. 
Now, I have done this before, but not for a while, Ethan, so you may not have seen this. But it's, it's, just, it's just about trust. Now, what I want you to do, you can turn around and face your family, right? Feet together. Close your eyes, right? Close your eyes. And at the count of three, just fall backwards. Put your arms out, right? Count of three, fall backwards. One, two, three. Ah! <laughs> ah. Try it. Let's try that one again. <laughs> you, you, now, you don't think I'm going to walk away, do you, and, and leave you flat on the floor, do you? Let, try that again. Right, feet together, arms out. One, two, three. Oh! Oh! <laughs> oh. Last chance. <laughs> Last chance. Feet together. Eyes closed. Arms out. One, two, three. <laughs> Dad, come out here. Dad. <laughs> what weight are you? Arms out, feet together, one, two, three. <laughs> Ethan, we're going to do that every Sunday till, till I see that you trust me, right? <laughs> okay, so trust, trust. And that's very much what the theme of, of today is about in this, in this season of, of Lent. That sometimes... The disciples, as we'll hear later today, the disciples found Jesus' words hard. Even when they had a, a real sense of who he was, they still found it hard to just completely trust in, in what he was saying. And the journey of Lent, really, is, is a journey that, that just asks us to look at how much, in fact, we do trust him and trust his words and the way he, he has asked us uh, to live. We're going to sing now the hymn 600. Spirit of God, unseen as the wind. A blessing on our children and young people before they go from here. Loving God, as they go from here, may they go with your blessing. And at all times in their lives, as they grow up, may they know your love and your peace. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hear the word of God, proclaimed in the New Testament. The reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, from verse 31 to 38. You will find it on page 44 in the New Testament section of the Bible in the pews. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory. Amen. Sorry, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Amen. The <coughs> choir will sing the anthem, Make in me a clean heart. Thank you. 
Hymn 214, to the tune Truro, You every morning is the love our wakening and uprising prove. Hymn 214. Words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. <coughs> and so trust, trust. On reflection, it occurs to me that what I should have done is rather than asking Johann to come out and me catch him, I should have asked Johann to come out I see what Ethan did if you were standing behind him. <laughs> so that might have been fun over lunch. <laughs> yeah, trust. Our, our passage today really needs to be put not just in its uh, historical context, but it needs to be put in its, its geographical context. Uh, just before the passage that we read, we, we read that Jesus took the disciples up to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Now, if he wanted a time away with, with them, just a, a quiet time away from the crowds, uh, there are lots of places that he could have done that that wouldn't have taken him far from Capernaum on the, where they were based on the, the shores of the Sea of Galilee. But no, they went a distance. They went away up to the villages of Caesarea Philippi to what if you, as you visit now, as, as some did when they were on our trip, uh, gosh, almost should be five years ago now. Um, it's the Temple of Pan up at Benias. It's one of the tributaries of the, of the Jordan River. Uh, it's quite a distance from, from Galilee, so it's certainly more than a, more than a day's walk. That, that's where he took them, to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And it was symbolic in that it was nothing to do with the fact that it had previously been a Temple of Pan. It was to do with the fact that Caesarea Philippi was the main army, if you like, base of the Roman Empire in the, in the north. That's where they were based at Caesarea Philippi. So in a sense, in all that follows, he's drawing a distinction between what he's saying and what he's teaching and the way of life that he is advocating and the way of life that people are asked to live under the, under the empire. And he's, he's drawing that, that clear distinction. And if you remember when they are there, away from all the crowds, 
He asks them, who do, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some think you're Elijah that's come, that's come back. And uh, eventually it's Peter, of course, that says, you are, you are the Messiah, the, the expected Messiah of the, of the people of, of Israel. So it seems that just for a moment, and all that's happened up to that point, and in taking them away there, Peter glimpses who he is, or thinks he does, because then he goes on to tell them what being a Messiah is going to involve. It's, it's going to ultimately involve, involve suffering and death, and he foretells his resurrection. And Peter says, no, 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 no. That's, that's not the expectation. That's not, where, that's not what we're looking for. That's not what's going to happen. That's not what we signed up for. And Jesus rebukes him. And it's interesting. You remember the first um, story that we had out of Mark's gospel, that the first thing that in Mark's gospel, the first act that, that Jesus does is an, is an exorcism. Right. And we're told there's this man in the synagogue at, at, at Nazareth, and he says to him, he rebukes the, whole, the spirits that are in him, and he says, come out. He rebukes these spirits, these evil spirits that are in this, in this man, in, in, the, in the story. Well, it's the same word here when he says he rebukes Peter. And in a sense, in both cases, he's, he's rebuking that which is not life-giving, but life destru destructive of life. Same word for both the, the, the man possessed by spirits and, and, now, and now Peter. And so he rebukes him and he says, no, this is the, this is the way it, 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 has, it has to be. All theology is done with, with hindsight. And of course, so too is the, is the writing of the Gospels. It's done with hindsight. Mark's Gospel, the earliest of the Gospels, certainly written after 70 AD, because it's clearly written after the temple in Jerusalem had been had been destroyed. So let's just say probably at least 40 years, at least 40 years after, after Jesus' death by, by crucifixion. And we need to, I suppose, bear that in mind when we, when we read this passage, because for the disciples, part of it just, just wouldn't make sense. For example, when Jesus said to them, if anyone want to become my followers, let them deny themselves. Well, perhaps so far so good, but then, and take up their cross and follow me. And that would puzzle them. Take up their cross and follow me. They would be familiar with crucifixion. It was a, it was a common sight in the, in the Palestine of Jesus' time, a common sight. The Roman Empire would, would crucify not just tens, not just hundreds, but thousands and they would be lined up outside at times the, the city of Jerusalem. As you left Jerusalem to travel in whatever direction, you would come across these crosses with the, with the victims hanging, hanging upon them. But it would puzzle the disciples because crucifixion was reserved for just a couple of categories. It was reserved for slaves. Slaves could be, slaves could be crucified. And these were not slaves. They were just ordinary working men from their different occupations round, round Galilee. And the other category that were crucified were those that engaged in, in revolution or rebellion against the Roman state. Now, certainly they perhaps thought that the coming of the Messiah was going to see the end of the Roman state in Palestine. But they wouldn't, I'm sure, see themselves as revolutionaries or, or rebellious. So when Mark records in his gospel these words, take up your cross and, and follow me, it, it seems much likely that this is a, a sense of, of, of hindsight. He knows that it does actually lead to the, to the cross. The disciples wouldn't have expected that at the time, although according to Mark, Jesus says quite, quite plainly. And that puts them, and puts them in, in the category of those that found themselves in, in opposition to the powers of the Roman 
of the Roman Empire. And then the other part of this that, that perhaps sounds strange to them and, and maybe even strange to us is that he says to them that this is something that must happen. This is something that must happen. Now, it's interesting that in more recent decades, that's been rather interpreted, interpreted differently. I mean, almost from the time of Paul, the great apostle Paul, it was interpreted in a particular way which, which influenced so much of the doctrine of the church through the centuries. And the particular doctrine is the, is the doctrine of atonement. That somehow Jesus had to be the sacrifice that had to be made to, if you like, pay for the sins of all God's people. And that became a standard teaching or doctrine, if you like, through the years. Although with, with numerous variations and, and different emphases. But we find it still, we find it still very much in our hymnary and in the, in the Easter hymns. Some of the simple Easter hymns, there is a green hill far away, for example, which talks about Jesus dying for us, for, for our sins, that we might, might be forgiven. It's the doctrine of the And in more recent years, people have grappled with this idea that, first of all, why would God require such a sacrifice? And, and why, why would it be through this man, his son, his son Jesus? How, what did God, what sense of God's being had to be, you know, satisfied with the with the death and the crucifixion of, of of his son? And it became very prevalent in the teaching of the church. And the strange thing is, it's not there. It's not there in Mark's gospel. And when Mark says that Jesus said that this must happen the way as I have said. It's not for any real doctrine of atonement. Instead of it, the word must, it would be better to understand it in terms of there is an inevitability of what we are doing and what I am doing. There's an inevitability about it and that in a sense we will be seen that the teaching that I am offering and the teaching that I'm living out about this coming kingdom of God, with all that that represents, with all its values, all its priorities, it puts you up against in contradiction to the ways of the empire. And when he was looking for his people to be freed, it's more freed from the power of empire and, and all that that meant for them in their daily lives. The oppression, the taxation, for some of them the poverty, it's, it's a, that's what lies at the heart of his proclamation of God's kingdom. And you can see the clash there between the sort of peace that the empire offered, always referred to as the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, but it was a peace that came by being subjugated. If you were prepared to be subjugated and oppressed and, and not kick against it, then things could remain peaceful. But if you were to oppose it, by opposing the cruelty and the taxation and, and the poverty that you might be, find yourself in, as was happening amongst the zealots and other rebellious groups. And remember, I mean, Jesus would have been brought up with the knowledge that in the village close to Nazareth, Sepporus, it had been annihilated because of a rebellion there against the Roman state. Absolutely destroyed and had to be completely completely rebuilt. That's the, the clash between God's kingdom, which Jesus came to proclaim, and the, the ways of, of, of empire. And the disciples find it difficult to trust, therefore, in his ways. Is this the way that life can be changed? Is this the way that society can be changed? Is this the way we can introduce the aspects of God's kingdom into life here on our society and, and on earth? Are you sure? Is that something we, we can trust? And they, and they found it difficult. And so I say for a moment, Peter glimpses 
that Jesus is the Messiah, and then immediately he says, but you know, what you're telling us is not the kind of Messiah that any of us are, are expecting. And that continues through, through Mark's gospel. It's a curious one, because in a way it says, he says to them openly that this will happen. And yet, throughout the rest of the gospel, he says, don't tell people, keep this, keep this hidden. So there's again, there's this sort of contradiction in, 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 Mark's, in Mark's gospel. But that, in a sense, is what this journey of Lent, um, in part, is about. In what can we trust? And you know, when we look at our societies, and when we, when we look at our world, and it's a challenging, it's a challenging question. In what can we trust? In what can we trust to, to bring about a greater peace and a greater well-being in, in people's lives? What, what is the way? What is the way to a fairer and a more just society? What is the way to address the vulnerability and the anxiety of, of others? And it's not the Pax Romana. It's not you'll have peaceful lives because we're going to subjugate you. It's you'll have peaceful lives by following in these ways of peace and in these ways of trusting. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In 489, come down, O love divine. Let us offer now our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, in whom and in what can we put our trust? In power and might, in armaments and oppression, we give thanks that we are shown as the disciples were shown, that we can put our trust in your ways. And we give thanks for being shown these ways in the lives of the prophets as they called for justice and fairness and a care for the most vulnerable. But above all, we give thanks that it was shown to us in the life of Christ. His comparing of his ways to the ways of empire. His ways of service rather than being served. His ways of denial of power and might rather than their use. And so we give thanks that we can trust in his ways and through his ways in your ways. And in his name, we offer now our prayers for others. We pray for those who are the victims of the abuse of power. Those who are oppressed at times by their own governments, their own people. Those who are oppressed because of their own way of life. We give thanks for those who find themselves oppressed because they are the victims of war and of violence and cruelty. Those who are oppressed because they see their homes and villages and towns and cities destroyed in the grasping of power and of territory. We give thanks for the hope of ordinary people, men, women and children, the hope for an end to such ways of power and of might, and the breaking in of your kingdom in our own time. And we pray too for those closest to us, for our families, wherever they may be at this time, and we ask your blessing upon them. For some, it is a time of celebration and excitement, of planning, of forthcoming marriages or births, of new challenges, new employment. Times of anticipation, excitement. For others, it is a time of struggle, of broken relationships, of unemployment, of the financial stresses that that brings. Whatever their situation, may they know your presence in their midst and in their lives. We pray too for those whom we know by name and of whose needs we are aware. Those whom we know are in hospital or ill. Those recovering from surgery or illness. Those receiving treatment still. And sadly, those for whose illness there is no cure. And for, their fam and for their families, we ask the blessing of your peace. In our midst, there are those who are anxious, fearful, lacking in confidence, just struggling a bit. We remember them in our prayers. We are those in our midst here on this island who struggle with homelessness living rough, living in cars, living in derelict accommodation. So we pray for a fairer society and a concern lived out for them. And always in our prayers, we remember those who have been bereaved, whether in recent days, months, or years, and live still with that sense of absence. As we bring before you those known to us by name, we do so in a moment of silence as we bring them to mind and bring them before you. O 
Oh, gracious God, whatever their hurt, whatever their wounds, bind them up and heal them. And whatever their need, may we find ourselves more committed to a care and a concern for them. We pray too for those who will go hungry this day, some in our midst, but many in this your world, and in a world of plenty. May we work for a fairer sharing of this your world's resources. And we pray for your church in this season of Lent, which gives us the time and the opportunity to reflect again on what it is you ask of us as individuals and as a community, to reflect on how trusting we are of your ways as we seek to move forward into what is your future. And always we remember with thanksgiving those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to receive. May we never think them far from us, for we share a communion, a fellowship with them still, through the mystery of the communion and fellowship that we have in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this, our offering, and all our offerings of our time, our talents, and our resources, praying that they may be symbols of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs and for the growth of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. In 402, take up your cross, the Saviour said, if you would my disciple be. In 402.
And now go in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and all whom you love, this day and always. Thank you.